So we're delighted today to be talking to Abby Elphinstone, whose latest book, Sky Song, has just been published. Abby, thank you very much for coming to talk to us. You know that our listeners are mainly teachers and student teachers, Mm. and you know what that's like. You've been a teacher yourself. (laughs) Can you tell us a little bit about your teaching background before we start to talk about the book? Sure. So I studied English at Bristol University and I left in 2006, I think it was. Um, And I moved to London. I'd grown up in Scotland. I'd only been to London once. And I think I was really bowled over by it. I was really excited by it. And so I moved to London and I got a job in PR and marketing, which I thought was going to be very glamorous. but It was very vacuous um, and I was utterly miserable. And I ended up booking a one-way ticket to Africa and I went and taught in a secondary school um, miles away from anywhere in Tanzania. And it was when I was out there that I thought, this is something I really would like to do. I'd like to work with children. My mum is a teacher. Two of my siblings are also teachers. But at the time when my mum was saying, I think you'd be good working with children. You'd love to teach. You know, you could combine literacy and your love of narrative and stories with children. And you sort of want to be really rebellious against your parents at the beginning. I was like, no. Um, But out in Africa, I realised it was something I really wanted to do. And I also started writing out there as well, writing a children's book. And when I came back to the UK six months later, I then worked in a school outside Newbury, where I started a GTP. And I taught for two years there um, in a secondary school. And then I moved to London and I taught in a co-ed school down near Richmond. And I'm now teaching full-time. I volunteer in a school, Essendine Primary, for Beanstalk Literacy Charity. Um, So, yeah, a teaching background. I'm interested to know whether any of your teaching um, has gone on to inform your writing in any way. I think a lot of people say, you know, what, what does it take to become a children's author? What do you need? I think fundamentally you need to understand how children think. You need to remember vividly what it was like to be a child and when you spend so much time in a classroom you do start to understand how children approach stories learning friendships tricky situations and definitely I think I understood kids a bit more and that helped in terms of writing for the right age group and I remember teaching Jamila Gavin's Coram Boy and I remember thinking it was quite a tightly structured and plotted book and the kids were in love with it and I remember that helped as well, sort of working out what types of books they enjoyed reading. So you've already said that you started to write when you were working in Africa. Mm. So tell us a little bit then about that transition, if you like, from being a teacher to becoming a published writer. For a long time, I tried to do both. And I was just so tired after a while. I'm sure anyone who teaches will appreciate just, you know, how much work there is in the marking and also in the lessons themselves you're on your feet the whole time it's so creative you give every ounce of yourself um creatively to the kids and so I'd get home mark till about eight o'clock maybe have a bit of supper and then I'd write until about 11 at night and it was slightly unsustainable and I realized that I wasn't giving everything to my books I was giving it all into my lessons and it was actually when I stepped back from teaching that I did eventually get my deal I started tutoring and working with children with dyslexia I've got dyslexia myself I started tutoring and so I could still earn a living but in much shorter hours than I would otherwise be doing and with no marking Um, but it was a really long and convoluted process getting my book published Um, I wrote four books over seven years the first of them I started out in Africa and I sent them off to about 30 agents and they all got rejected so I ended up clocking up 96 rejections from literary agents before I got the Dream Snatcher published which was my debut book back in 2015 and that was signed luckily by an agent very quickly but I do whenever I do loads and loads of school visits now and whenever I go to a school I talk about the importance of failure and not to say you know hooray let's all just fail at everything but to say anything creative involves a great deal of work and it's very hard emotionally on yourself because you're often knocked back and so I think once people understand that that actually creativity has ups and downs and many many downs first then it's a lot more liberating and people feel that they can approach writing a story a a lot of kids I speak to I say what do you want to be when you grow up and they say oh I want to be a YouTube star or something and I'm like but what is that what are you YouTubing about and there's this idea that fame or that success comes very quickly I think to the sort of millennial generation and I think the only bits of good luck that have ever happened to me have been through graft hard work perseverance and so that's usually a message that I speak to kids about a lot. 
We're going to talk about your wonderful new novel, Sky Song. Just as a, a lead in, can you tell us a little bit about the book? So Sky Song is set in the snowy kingdom of Erkenwald and it's a land where wolves hunt in the forest and whales glide between the icebergs and polar bears roam the glaciers. But the people in this land are not so easy to find. Um, There are three tribes, tusk, feather and fur. And those people, those children are all lying hidden because this is a land ruled by an ice queen. And she lives at Winterfang Palace and she is collecting voices, um, stealing voices. And once she has stolen the voice of every single man, woman and child in the land, she will become immortal and on her organ made of icicles, she will play this sinister anthem with all these stolen voices. And the sky gods, huge giants carved out of stardust, who once sort of ruled the land very peacefully and calmly well well, she hopes to tear them down as she becomes immortal and she starts her own reign of eternal darkness (laughs) i'm glad you said erkenwald so now i know how to pronounce it um it's a wonderful story it's got this wonderful mythic introduction and as i'm reading it i've got echoes of the snow queen Mm. and narnia and even a little of michelle pavers Chronicles of Ancient oh. Darkness. Tell us a little bit about your literary inspirations. I'm yeah. sure that some of these must have been yeah. inspirational to you. Well, the first thing, actually, about the fairy tale opening, and this is how important editors are. So I started the book at chapter one initially with Esker trapped in a music box. And it was my editor who said to me, I just feel that this book could perhaps benefit from a fairy tale style prologue, a sort of overview, a, an introduction to Erkenwald and the Northern Lights and what they really are, because I invented a magical reason for why they flash across the sky. So yeah, that was actually something that came later, but was one of the most enjoyable pieces to write, and also the epilogue that slightly frames it as well. Um, and I wanted to create, like you just touched on with the Snow Queen, an extended fairy tale, and um, this idea of a big adventure with an epic feel, and with a lot of character development, which sometimes doesn't happen in fairy tales, But with the language of fairy tale, that opening, you know, sort of once an adventure digs its claws in and there's not an awful lot you can do about it, especially when magic's involved. And that sort of like cosy, but slightly unhinged British narrative voice that I really love. So definitely the Snow Queen and the Little Mermaid as well. This idea of voices being stolen, you know, the sea witch. I think there's a darkness to fairy tales that is often overlooked. I'm drawn to the fact that Fairy tales are simple in language, but bold in theme, memorable in motif. Um, Michelle Paver, who you touched upon, I learned how to write action scenes from Michelle Paver. I don't think any writer writes as concisely and atmospherically as she does. And her Chronicles of Ancient Darkness with Wolf and Torak, um, I just was bowled over by. I, when I was a teacher, actually, I used a lot of extracts from Wolf Brother, Spirit Walker and those, that series to teach children how to write suspense and craft it and how to sort of teach language analysis as well. Um, so definitely her and Narnia, yes. Um, I don't think there's a moment in literature as powerful as that moment when Lucy Pevensey pushes open the wardrobe door and there is a snowy forest beyond. And the fact that she's the youngest of the four Pevensey siblings and she's the one they doubt and they slightly look over. And I think that it's often the way that magic comes to the most unsuspecting child in the family possibly the the one that other people have given up on slightly um so i very much wanted to write a book that might capture the snowy world of narnia without sort of leaning on it too much but the white witch obviously was a huge inspiration when i was building my own ice queen and i was able to do different things like the um gown that my ice queen wears is made of frozen tears and she has a wolverine beside her and a crown of snowflakes and that was all such fun you know, drawing original pieces but in the back of my mind I couldn't help but be influenced by literary giants like C.S. Lewis for sure. There's so much that I want to ask you based on what you've just said but before I lose the idea Esker trapped mm. in the music box was such a wonderful image I wonder where that image came from and how soon in the writing was it something that was there right at the beginning? It really is so very, very powerful. Well, I mentioned earlier about fairy tales having such powerful motifs and images like Little Red Riding Hood's cloak, um, the hound with the eyes as large as saucers and Hansel and Gretel, the gingerbread house. And I think for me, the idea of a music box felt classical and old school fairy tale in a way. 
And the, and the idea of a, a character sort of turning inside, being slightly clockwork or controlled, felt beautiful but also eerie. Um, so there was that that definitely sprung to mind, the idea of an image that I wanted to use. But also, on a slightly stranger level, I was fascinated about the idea of being trapped in one place. Because um, So last year, I spent um, a third of the year in hospital. I have a baby boy who is very healthy now. He's six months old. But the road to becoming a mother was very difficult. I had, I'd lost three babies and I was finally pregnant with a fourth baby that seemed like everything was going to be all right. And then I went into hospital at 23 weeks gestation and stayed there until the end and was told every single day, it's quite likely that you're going to have your baby today. So I had to wait in a bed for four months, being very, very, very frightened, but also desperately bored. (laughs) And I had a a room um, a ward with other women and there was a window and I could see just a little patch of the sky of the world going you know past and now and again maybe a bird would fly by or a cloud would drift and I remember thinking well life is just going on completely indifferently to me and I'm stuck in here with these hugely intense and terrifying thoughts and I remember thinking well what about having a character who is trapped in one place who yearns to be somewhere else Um, And then this idea of this music box started, I think, you know, ideas and characters are often a fusion of various things. And it was the archaic image of a fairy tale sort of music box with my own situation. And I think, you know, a lot of people, if if you said to them, you're going to spend a third of a year in bed in a hospital ward, you think couldn't possibly do it. But I think I just continually I'm amazed at how indomitable the human spirit is. And I was told... Every day there was horrendous news, like, this will probably be your only chance to have a child. We're, we're going to do a hysterectomy. You're going to lose a lot of, you know, blood. And it was terrifying. And, and I just, throughout it all, just kept feeling hopeful. And the idea of hope and the fact that it can... Some days I'd feel very hopeful, and then the next day I'd feel utterly bereft and grief-stricken and think that I was, yeah, devoid of any hope... And then there's a line in the book, you find hope shining in the hearts of your friends. And I'd look over and then one of my friends was there bolstering my spirits. And so, yeah, I think I learned a lot about human strength (laughs) um, emotionally and also about the compassion and kindness of other people and also courage. Um, So a lot of that goes into Sky Song through Eska, the girl trapped in a music box, but also through Flint and Blue, two characters she journeys through the Nevercliffs with. Well, we'll come to those characters in a moment because I think we do need to talk about them. We've mentioned Michelle Paver, and like Michelle Paver, you are something of an intrepid explorer. We all know that she actually went out yeah. to the Norwegian Arctic. Forest and the Arctic, mm, didn't she? Yeah. Yes, yeah. So I wonder about your landscapes and how they've been informed by your travels. Mm. Um, So I touched on earlier the fact that I grew up in Scotland um, and my weekends were spent scrambling over the moors, building dens in the forest, climbing trees, carving catapults. A lot of that found its way into the Dream Snatcher series. But above all, I think a childhood like that instilled in me a sense of wonder, an unparalleled sense of wonder at wild places. And I feel setting is as important as character and plot. Um, You can get so much of a feel for a book and a world from the setting. I think there's a a really good quote by John Muir that's, um, the world is big and I want to have a good look at it before it gets dark. And I feel that constantly, that I want to get out and see uh, so many places in our world and I want to write about them. And so each book I write tends to focus on a setting that I've explored, whether it was as a child, the Night Spinner, the third book in the Dream Snatcher trilogy is based on places I grew up in Scotland. Um, But Sky Song was very much a sort of amalgamation of fairy tales that I'd read when I was a child and wild adventures in the furthest corners of our world. I went to the Arctic, to northern Norway, to research this book. And I'm fascinated about communities and animals that live on the very fringes of our world, that live right at the edge. I went dog sledding across the ice. I saw the northern lights rippling across the sky and I watched orcas um, dive for herring. And I think the Arctic really captures the beauty the power and the fragility of the wild because it's an area under threat from oil drilling and global warming and I remember when I flew in with my husband um we looked out of the aeroplane window and when we went up there it was a polar night the sun doesn't rise from October to March and I remember looking at the icy fjords and the mountains as we flew in to um, Tromso northern Norway and I thought well this is a land a very barren land this is empty of people animals 
there's barely even any light. I was like, there's going to be nothing to write about. But the more time I spent in the Arctic, I realised this was a place teeming with noise, whispering actually more like, um, the underwater clicks of the orcas. We went and watched orcas feed on herring and humpbacks as well. The whir of ptarmigan wings, the little white grouse as they flew over the mountains, the near silent tread of deer, and even the northern lights, which seemingly flicker silently above you, you feel like you can hear them twisting and rolling through the sky. And the idea of an ice queen's enchanted anthem, the idea of there being music on the ice, then drifted into my head um, and I started to write that kind of a story. So definitely the book was informed by exploring the Arctic, but also Mongolia. I remembered seeing a photograph by an Israeli photographer, Asher Svedensky, of an eagle huntress called Aishalpan. And not just any old eagle huntress, the only eagle huntress in Mongolia. So I think the caption below read, there's a tribe of people in Mongolia called the Kazakh Eagle Hunters. And every single person in this tribe is a man or a boy, apart from Aishalpan, this 12-year-old girl. And I thought, wow, what a heroine, you know, the only eagle huntress in Mongolia. And then I thought, well, could I combine this somehow with my Arctic setting? So I've ended up um, writing this girl who at the beginning of the book is trapped in the music box, who is timid, lacking in voice and the use of her limbs. And then she breaks free and discovers this golden eagle. And I, I was lucky enough to go out to Mongolia to meet Aishalpan. There's since been a documentary called The Eagle Huntress by Otto Bell, um, which has been hugely popular and it's the same girl. But I went out to Mongolia and I knew that there was an eagle hunter festival where the best hunters in the land would gather just outside Ulgi, which is west um, Mongolia. And I hoped that Aishalpan might turn up. And sure enough, she did. The only girl riding into the arena. Um, and the arena was just a sort of, I don't know, hollow in the mountains. It was um, still outside but, and very remote. But I ended up going to stay with her in her gur, a little felt house with her and her family, Agalai and Alma. And we went hunting with her golden eagle. And it, it, it was mesmerising. It, it felt like the closest thing I could possibly get to magic, watching this golden eagle soar through the clouds and then dive. They dive for foxes, wolves and marmots. And then the huntress or the hunter makes clothes out of these furs because, I mean, there's no shops to buy, you know, fancy jackets and that kind of thing out there. They're very much relying on the, the animals that they can catch to make their own clothes. So definitely Esker was inspired by an adventure out in the wilds of Mongolia. I think that comes across really clearly in your writing. Um, I felt that there were some moments that were so beautifully observed. They could only have been written by somebody who'd been there and had heard those things. Uh, there's one moment where you talk about the tightening of mittens on the sledge handle, and I thought that is so specific. Mm. I don't believe that's just completely out of the imagination. Somebody has heard that sound. Definitely. It's, it's funny you pick up on the idea of listening, because... I'm quite a clumsy person and I tend to sort of charge through life um, a little bit like Moll in the Dream Snatcher series. And I was quite used to writing a girl that was impetuous and reckless and adventurous. And it was a challenge for me to write Esker because she's an observer, she's a listener and she watches and she looks into the heart of things and out the other side to the things that most people miss. And so I tried to write the book almost from her point of view of noticing keenly, watching fiercely, and I think with our ever restless world and with all our technology, we sometimes forget just to sit and watch and to listen. My husband and I have banned phones from the, from the sitting room when we watch TV because we found, felt that we weren't really listening to what each other was saying and we were watching films whilst being on Twitter or something hopeless. And I thought, I think there's a real skill in listening and watching. And, the, and as you picked up on the squeak of mittens was when I was dog sledding up in the Arctic. And the only thing I could hear, it was utterly silent in this valley, was the creak of wood as we slid through the, um, through the snow. Then we approached a corner and I remember feeling just slightly scared and I tightened my grip on the back of the sled and the mittens squeaked. And I just thought, well, I'll write that in for, for Flint. Flint, at one point in the story, says that all forms of magic fascinate him why do you think we still need magic in our lives and what are these different forms of magic i think partly because we can explain so much science is so advanced that we know the answers to so many things and i remember when i saw the northern lights i in the back of my mind i thought right so this is the solar wind interacting with the earth's magnetic field and there's a reaction and there are colors in the sky but when you actually watch colours unfurl across the night sky, 
it's impossible to believe that that's all it is. You, you, you do think, God, there are sky gods up there, you know, giants carved from stardust. And I like the idea that not everything's explained or answerable. And definitely in the wild, there feels as if there are questions yet unanswered and that the research hasn't quite gone far enough to discover why this is why it is or whatever. Um, and I'm fascinated by things that exist slightly beyond the, the sort of textbook answers. So why do we need magic? I think because it's so hopeful and such a, an exciting thing to believe in. And as a child, you have the capacity for wonder and the capacity to believe in magic. And I think as you grow older, you grow more knowing and more cynical. And even though your world is essentially getting wider and you are, your knowledge is getting more expansive, I feel that your imagination often shrinks. And I think magic and wonder are inseparable. And for me, I find a lot of magic in the wild. So I think that, yeah, if you can remember to think like a child, you often find your way back into magic. I think that's really interesting. I think, um, for me, that sometimes the acquisition of knowledge can lead you to seeing the magic in something as well because the explanation is so complex yeah. and so fascinating and you think that in itself is a yeah. magic no definitely did you read it was, when was it, a few months ago about those whales that had washed up on a beach and scientists believe that they washed up because they were following the northern lights or something or there was a change in the pattern of the northern lights and they ended up washing up on a beach and that was I feel a start of a story and even even actually the ice queen came from me researching a scientific fact and then feeling oh I could go further than this um so I discovered that scientists measure the increase in air pollution by drilling down into the ice in the arctic and once they drill so far down they get to pockets of air that are utterly unpolluted because they're they're thousands of years old these this air so they extract that ancient air and they compare it with air nowadays and they can see the increase in pollution and i started to think well what if this ancient air was a spirit trapped in the ice and then sure enough my ice queen is trapped in the ice and then it takes one bad soul to melt that ice and she's unleashed so i I like the way yeah that you can magic often starts where science leaves off i like that i think something else that comes across in your books is the connection between the human and the natural world, and in particular the bond between human beings and animals. Mm. Flint has his fox pup, and Esker has her eagle. Simple question first, dog or eagle for you? And then perhaps tell us a little bit more about how you see that connection between humans and animals. So undoubtedly eagle. (laughs) Um, My dad used to take me up onto the moors up in Angus in Scotland to look for golden eagles. And sometimes we'd catch a glimpse of this sort of, yeah, golden feathered beauty in the sky. Or we'd see their eyrie, their nest up on a crag. And other days the eagles wouldn't show. And what I love about wild animals as opposed to pets, and I'm fond of pets as well, but what I especially love about wild animals is that they're unpredictable. And it's so rewarding when you do get a glimpse of an eagle or the dorsal fin of an orca. It's not something that you're guaranteed to see. And I love, there's a, there's a line in Sky Song, um, this is the wild and the wild doesn't play by ordinary rules. And I like, I like anarchic characters and anarchic um, animals. The idea that it, it does exactly what it wants, the wild. It doesn't bend to your purpose. You can't control it. There are no apps to ensure you see a shooting star. You know, you've just got to chance it and hope it's there. And I think that's a very magical thing. And I am fascinated by people who do have incredible bonds with animals. Um, the Mongolian eagle hunters, they treat these golden eagles like a member of their family. Um, and they release them after 10 years and they fly back into the wild. And it's like saying goodbye to a friend. They mourn the loss of their friend. Um, and I, yeah, I love the idea that there are some people in this world that share unbreakable bonds with animals. And I think as a child also, you dream of having this connection with an animal that might go above and beyond the ordinary sort of connection with a hamster or like a gerbil or a guinea pig. You know, a connection with a wolf or an eagle, something that can't be tamed, that is rarely seen, is a very powerful thing. Esker goes through the process of naming her eagle. I think you choose a name that's uh, from Kazakhstan, is that right? And there's a lot of thought process that goes on. You know, she says, I'm going to name you because I'm here 
and because you're here and that the name should sound wild, the kind of word that the wind would use if it could speak, but mm. not quite. And there's a lot of thought process behind getting just the mm. right name. Of course, that's true for writers as well. You have to find just the right name for your characters. Yeah. So you must have given some thought to Names. Flint and Esker and Blue. Mm. Tell us about that. Naming characters is, is a great deal of fun. It's also hugely important, and there's loads of things you've got to consider when you're writing for children. You can't have names that they can't pronounce. And I know Hermione in Harry Potter was a bit contentious because a lot of kids read that as just Hermoyne, but actually it worked really well in the end. So you've got to have names they can pronounce. And so the attraction with Flint was it's monosyllabic, and Flint, it's a tool, a type of metal rock that the characters, the Inuits, would have used once so I liked that the connotations and both the ease of the word fitted with the children's book I wanted to write um Eska derived from Eskimos but now we call Inuits um and I just thought that was quite a beautiful sounding word Balapan did indeed come from the Kazakh eagle hunters themselves I think they're eagles they call them something according to their age so a, 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 I think it's an eagle when it's one year old is called Balapan and then it changes to board like Talakan or whatever and they slightly change but I thought Balapan and Bala slightly you know the shortened version where one of the characters Blue calls Balapan Bala I did think that sounded fluid and powerful but also in a strange way accessible Erkenwald is the name given to the fictional land in Sky Song and it was actually the name I gave to a kingdom when I wrote my very first book that got rejected obviously years and years and years ago and I remember an agent saying I'm not sure about Erkenwald because it's difficult for children but I felt so strongly that I did want to use it and right then I hadn't got a book deal so I chucked it straight away and thought right I need to do away with that but when I came back years later I thought no I really strongly believe that Erkenwald is is magical sounding and there's a sort of gravitas a sense that Erkenwald has been there for as long as the United Kingdom or longer or whatever. So I had fun naming the kingdom and I just drew on something I sort of origi originally had come up with. But um, place names within the book. I love creating atmospheric place names. Like I remember C.S. Lewis's Care Paravel. It sounded so ethereal and I think he had the shuddering woods. That could have been him. Again, so onomatopoeic. And when I was a teacher, I did a lot with crafting names with children because they love creating fictional maps and then using alliteration or word connotation to create a, an atmospheric name so things like um the never cliffs i guess the idea of never that they never end um neverland as well there's something hugely i don't know full of possibility with the never cliffs um the devil's dance floor is actually a real place it's a part of the sea near greenland that many sailors fear to go because it's so treacherous high winds storms whirlpools but i used devil's dance floor for a frozen lake in the book and then there's a frozen waterfall as well which i called the giant's beard and i just i love coming up with character names and place names tell us a little bit about blue then we find that there aren't enough characters of any kind of diversity in children's literature and perhaps children who are disabled in some way are the least represented. Mm -hmm. Here she occurs very naturally in the story. It's mm -hmm. not about her disability. She's integral mm -hmm. to the story. How important was this to you? And, and tell us a bit about that. Blue has Down syndrome. I never say in the book, this character has Down syndrome, but it's very much implied in, what, in how she looks and how she acts and speaks. So my husband's little sister, my sister-in-law, um, Steph, has Down syndrome. And when I first met her years and years ago, I naively thought of all the things I could do to protect her and look after her. I was like, I'll get your coat. I'll make sure you're warm enough. Are you, you know, have you had enough food? And I infantilized her, I think. I treated her younger and, and wanted to look after her. And then the more I got to know Steph, I realized that she was teaching me an immeasurable amount about life and about joy. And actually, when I was in hospital for four months last year, she was the person that I rang most days to cheer me up. Um, she finds joy in the most unlikely situations. She's impossibly brave. And she's very, very, very funny. Her sense of humor is, is brilliant. And yeah, I started to learn so much about, I think, humanity through her. And so I thought, well, here's a character that could totally hold her own in an adventure story. So Flint does have his little sister, Blue, along with him. And I didn't want to write it as if that's just fine and she was as much of the adventure as the other two and, and she could cope with the adventure in the ways that Esker and Flint coped. She can't. She's physically less able. She's mentally 
less astute. But it doesn't mean that she doesn't have qualities that are needed to beat the Ice Queen. And there's a moment where they eventually find the entrance to the Lost Chambers, where the Feather Tribe are hiding. And it's Blue that shows Flint the way in, um, and that was significant for me. And so I wanted a character who would challenge what it means to be strong and brave. There's a line that Esker says to Flint when Flint nearly loses Blue, and he cries. The book deals a lot with what it means to be a man. Flint's being trained to become a warrior on the ice. All he wants to do is become an inventor. And he cries, and he, he says, oh, God, that's embarrassing. I nearly lost Blue, and I'm crying. This is not a very warrior thing to do. I'm, I'm so, so embarrassed. And Esker says, well, tears are just a warm-up for courage. And I think Flint and Esker wouldn't realise that without the character of Blue. So she's a route through to compassion and to self-awareness and different types of courage, I think, and different types of manliness, perhaps, as well. So she was called Sky. Well, actually, she was called Ugg originally. I love guttural-sounding names, and I thought it was really sweet, but my editor said, I think that sounds too primitive and too almost offensive. It's You've got to be very careful what you're doing with this character. Couldn't she have a more elegant and beautiful name and so I changed it to Sky with an E and then the book was originally called Snow Cry and when we spoke to some booksellers before the book was about to print they said we love the title but bear in mind that if you call it Snow Cry it's going to make it very seasonal and children might want to pick up the book in June and if it says snow on it they might be a bit like oh I don't know maybe it's a winter book so they said could you come up with a title that was that's slightly less seasonal. And so I came up with Sky Song, and then I realised, no, I have Sky God, Sky Song, and a character called Sky. So then I tried to change her to something else, blue without an E. Um, and both me and my editor, we were thinking of colours, strangely. We wanted something simple but bright and hopeful. And so blue came along out of that. And it goes with Sky. Sky yeah. blue, that's perfect. I wonder whether we could talk a little bit about the writing process when you are starting a book, how do you go about that? Do you keep notebooks? Do you plot first and then research? How does it all fit together for you? I went to a talk once by David Armand, who's one of my literary idols. I think his prose is effortless and Skellig is completely magical. And I remember him saying, well, just sto- the story just arrived. It was just there. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm like one of those writers that needs to tie themselves to a chair and thrash out the prose. I don't know whether it's because I'm dyslexic, which I touched on earlier, but I do need to plan. My ideas arrive completely chaotically and half worked out and jumbled. And I'm a very visual learner. And so the first thing I do once I've decided on a setting, because that setting comes before character or plot, possibly because the wild and settings are such an important part of my life. Um, but the first thing I do is I draw a map of my imagined setting. So with Sky Song, I drew Erkenwald, and I thought, well, if I've got a snowy land, I'll have some mountains, I'll have some ice plains, I'll have icebergs called the groaning splinters, I'll have a deep, tangled spruce forest, I'll have a glacier that's crumbling, and you could have a palace on it. And then once I'd drawn this land, I then got a different coloured pen, and I drew a journey. And I started imagining, well, if my main character started trapped in a palace, might she make her way to the forest and meet somebody? Might she be betrayed in the Driftlands? Might she discover something very sinister at the Devil's Dance Floor? Might she be reunited with a friend at the Lost Chambers? And my plots happen, well, my plots are journeys because I love quest books and I love movement in stories. I love characters who go through different scenes, scenery as well. So definitely the book starts as a picture as a map and then I'm even more detailed after that then I break down each chapter into bullet points Um, so I'm just starting my brand new series at the moment the unmapped chronicles and I've just written the first chapter and that's it's bullet points that I don't follow exactly but that give me a frame and that make writing feel less daunting and I think why I loved teaching creative writing to kids and why hopefully they really enjoyed it too is because I understand how crushingly hard it can be to write a story and I felt a couple of days ago really really out of my depth again I thought I can't I can't remember how to write you know I don't know how to do it but then gradually by drawing by planning I felt my way back into this new series so some scenes 
do just arrive. They're almost cinematically clear in my head and I just write them out. But I write chronologically. I write the story from beginning to end. I usually write a chapter and it's all wobbly. Then the next day I go back and make it good. Then I move on to the next chapter. Write it wobbly, make it good. And it's a slow way of doing it um, and it's quite methodical. But I write quest books with lots of twists and adventure and action. And I think if you do write that kind of a book, you've often got to plot very carefully. Now, with all jobs whether it's writing or teaching, there are usually parts of it that we love and bits that we don't like quite as much. Do you love everything about writing or are there some bits that are less appealing and some bits that you really love? I don't not like it, but I find it difficult coming up with an idea for a plot originally because it's so easy to lean on stories that you've loved and to reuse ideas. Um, I think Frances Hardine is amazing at coming up with very original, strikingly original ideas. I'm reading her Skin Full of Shadows at the moment. I adored the concept for the lie tree. So sometimes I get a little bit overwhelmed at the beginning of trying desperately to come up with something new. But I think it was Aristotle who said there's only eight stories. And so actually we are all reusing methods and patterns it's how you tell the story and that kind of thing um but yeah that that definitely overwhelms me at the beginning sometimes and sometimes edits can be tricky when there's something structural that isn't quite right and you've got to move scenes around and the mechanics of the story can feel very disjointed and labored so that sometimes I find difficult and having the self-belief to get to the end I write my books that are about sort of 60,000 words when you're I'd say 20,000 words in you're like I've, I've got this. I can do it. Anything below that, I often feel a bit like, am I going to get to the end? It was the last book I ever wrote going to be Sky Song? I don't know. So those are the bits I find hard. Um, the things I like, I love how exciting it can be to sit down with a blank screen. I've just said this is terrifying, but it's also exciting how you can sit down and there's nothing there and then you invent something from nothing. And I think that's a hugely powerful thing to be able to do is to create and I had a lot of time as a child to be bored I had a lot of unstructured play I didn't have extra tuition I didn't have after school clubs because I was in the wild and my after school club was club was just my mother opening the door and saying be back for tea so I had a lot of time to invent stories narratives to draw pictures to uh, make flower petal potions with soil and leaves and yeah so I think I'm a writer because I had space to think as a child and now I relish that when I sit down in my writing shed and I, like, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of something new and I'm building a world. And it's exciting when you write a sentence that feels, the rhythm of it feels right, the sentiment feels right, and it's advancing the story and the characters and you just really feel invested in it all. And that's a really lovely thing to feel. I know we've already talked about magic, but I would say that writing is a kind of magic where you can put a few black lines on a page that can create an image so striking as some of the images in your stories. I would say that that's a kind of magic too. Uh, Just to finish off, I wonder whether you'd be willing to give us, to the teachers who are listening, three tips for how they might best support the young writers in their classes. The first thing I'd say is to turn them into keen watchers. Make them watch the world fiercely like Esker does in Sky Song um, whether that's giving them a notebook and saying you know I want you to go out and break and or go out for homework in your garden if you've got one or go to the park or just at some outside space or even in your bedroom open the windows at night when the moon's shining and note down five exciting things I think Frank Cottrell Boyce said recently one of his bits of advice was keep a diary and don't write pages and pages each evening because that's difficult to do and none of us have time to do that write one sentence per day and make that sentence just something that was quite interesting about your day and then at the end of the year you've got 365 interesting sentences and so I think that's a really fun thing for teachers and to encourage children to do Um, but yeah first of all turn them into keen watchers don't be afraid to let children this is the second point don't be afraid to let children draw their way into stories I used to think that doodling was bad I've got a short attention span and teachers used to tell me off for doodling but doodling for me is a way into my stories my books um drawing maps so possibly for visual children the idea of drawing the world first and letting the plot take shape from that and then ultimately the idea of just pressing home that 
it's okay not to get it right first time. I had a look at David Armand's notepad once, and he is a writer who effortlessly just sort of seems to write. The story just flows. But his notebook was an absolute mess. It looked like sort of several dead spiders, you know, just like scrunches of black and scribbles. And I think once children know that stories start messy and that it's okay to get things wrong, then that's an, an encouraging launch pad. Abby, thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. Thank it's been uh, not only a pleasure, but so informative. And I know that it's going to be really interesting for our listeners. Thank you.